Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Mobile Slaughter Units and International Perspective. I am Lauren Gwynn, Director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network based at Oregon State University. I'm your host today along with our program manager, Catherine Kwanbeck. We do webinars on topics related to small-scale meat processing and farmers and ranchers who raise meat for local and other niche markets. If you'd like to be on our email list, please sign up at our website. We'll type the, uh, the URL into the chat box. For those of you who don't know MPAN, we are a network of processors, farmers and ranchers, universities, public agencies, nonprofit groups, other small-scale meat-related businesses, and others. Our mission is to support the success of small and very small meat processors because they are essential partners in bringing local sustainable meat and poultry to market. MPAN is also part of eExtension, an initiative of the National Land Grant University System. So three things before we start. There will be time for questions, both during and after the presentations. To ask a question, please type it into the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. This webinar is being re re recorded and will be posted on the MPAN website for later viewing, along with the presentation slides. We have a full agenda today and we'll get to as many questions as possible. If your question doesn't get answered, please email us after the webinar and we'll try to get it answered. And Catherine and I will write our We'll type our email addresses into the chat box. So our agenda today, the first USDA inspected mobile slaughter unit, MSU, for red meat species began operating in 2002. And we have that operator with us today, Bruce Dunlop. Since then, mobile slaughter units have not only evolved in size and design, but have also gone international, operating in Europe, South America, Papua New Guinea, and soon in Africa. On this webinar, we'll hear about MSUs operating both in the U.S. and overseas. We'll learn how they meet regulatory requirements, how they handle animals humanely, manage water, assure food safety, and more. We'll discuss MSU design concepts, challenges, and future improvements, and leave plenty of time for Q&A. And I'd just like to add that this webinar was inspired when one of our speakers, Thomas from Sweden, got in touch with us. And he is very interested in establishing an international community of practice among mobile slaughter unit operators where you can share information and best practices and uh, for everyone's mutual benefit. So we'll discuss that and folks interested in that can follow up with me afterwards. So first I'd like to introduce Bruce Dunlop. Bruce is an old friend of mine and he is a livestock producer and member of Island Grown Farmers Cooperative in Washington State. He built that first USDA inspected mobile slaughter unit for red meat species and has consulted on many others. Previously, he was a chemical engineer in the bioag and food industries, but he has for a long period of time been farming on Lopez Island. So Bruce, take it away. Bruce, um, you need to unmute, unmute your microphone. Be patient with us, everyone. This is the first time we've done a webinar where all the speakers are over the computer because we have a participant from Sweden. So we'll give Bruce just another minute to Everything worked a few minutes ago, so we'll just give him another minute to get unmuted. But then if we need to, what we can do is uh, charge on ahead and have Thomas's presentation, and then we'll work with Bruce and then come back to that. Yeah, that would yeah, be great. Oh, uh, there you are, Bruce. Presentation. Presentation. Oh, the, oh, oh, Thomas, you're there. Okay. So we're going to go ahead with Thomas's presentation. Thomas, just mute for one more second, please. There, yes. then we won't have yes. my echo. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Oh, Bruce, you're there. Excuse me, everyone. Okay, we've got it going. So I, I, let's charge ahead. I will mute. I am. You I am. Take it away, Bruce. Okay, thank you. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is how we evolved over the last um, 
12 to 15 years in our mobile slaughter trailers. What you see on the screen is one of the ones that we've, we've built subsequent to the very first one. And we refer to this as essentially our standard fully mobile trailer. And it's designed to be able to work at a different site uh, every day. Um, and there's a, there's a spectrum here from something like this that, that can move every day to uh, a modular that is going to stay at one place all the way to a fixed facility that's purpose built on site. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, so let me just run through this. There's now, uh, we've now been involved in about 19 of these, these units. Some of them are mobile and some are, are built as, as modular facilities. Um, this is looking inside the trailer. Um, it has a processing area where the animals are uh, skinned and eviscerated and then in the far forward it has a cooler where they can start chilling on site. Um, this is just another shot of one that's working up in Alaska. Shows the inside processing area. And a schematic, we've got this designed in, in three sections with a processing, a holding cooler with rails and a refrigeration system. And then in the front of the trailer are all of the mechanical pieces to make everything, everything work. Uh, there's a little bigger shot of the processing area. It includes sink, sterilizer, lights, ventilation. Everything that you need to operate with the door shut to do the processing. And then once an animal is processed, uh, one of the, the major requirements from the USDA and other inspection services is that you start cooling the carcass right away. And so this is designed that by the next morning, all the carcasses are down to the required temperature, both for food safety and for meat quality. And then the front of the trailer is used for storing equipment, water tank, water pump, heater for hot water, uh, refrigeration equipment, and electrical generation. This is essentially what IGFC has been using now for about 14 years as a processing trailer that every day is at a different farm, and it typically operates four to five days a week and returns either every night or every other night back to a base facility to unload the carcasses into a cooler there. And that's a traditional building where the cutting and packaging and, and subsequent processing takes, takes place. And the, the people that have been successful operating one of these generally uh, operate both the slaughter trailer and, and the um, cutting fabrication facility. As one as one business, <clears throat> um, getting to uh, a slightly less mobile environment. This is this is a uh, docking station that's in southern Chile, and it's set up to operate with with hogs, cattle, and sheep. And this was one of the uh, requirements from the regulatory. Uh, agency in Chile is that there be a more elaborate um, system where the animals were processed than is, is um, typically uh, required by the USDA in the United States. Um, is that working? Yes. Anyway, um, so their concept is that they're going to go to one place and bring the animals to it and that they're eventually going to build several of these docking stations in the, in the territory that they're uh, serving. And then at the end of the day, they, they can transport their carcasses back to their facility in the, in the trailer. Um, IGFC operates a little bit um, differently than this in that they're often at different locations. Some locations they may only go to a few times a year, and other locations they may go once a week. Uh, and obviously, the requirements for the on-farm facilities are different depending on how frequently you're, you're there. So you'll find that somewhere where you're operating every day, as in this facility, 
you see a lot more infrastructure and concrete set up in order to keep the place clean and, and neat and suitable for operation. This is the trailer in Chile backed up against the docking station. Um, someone's playing with my slides. Anyway, there, there it is. You can see the entrance to the mechanical station. And then it's, it's set up uh, to back up to where the stunning uh, chute is, is um, located on the pad. Animals are stunned and bled outside the unit. Um, where they can be done more safely and then brought into the unit. Here's a shot of the inside of that unit. As you can see, everything's designed to be cleanable. Um, there's, there's hot water available, good lighting, refrigeration, uh, everything that, that the inspectors are going to look for in a, in a facility, whether it's a, a trailer or a building, in order to be able to do a clean processing job on the animals. Um, this is a something that was added to the Chilean unit. It's an outside sink and sterilizer station and it, it allows the individual who's handling the animals and doing the stunning to be able to uh, wash up and clean and sterilize his tools without having to go into the trailer to, to do it. This, this is a very simple little sink and sterilizer unit that's set up with quick connect fittings and it can be taken off the trailer in a few minutes and stowed inside for transport. Um, going to the other end of our spectrum from what we build are modular units. These, these essentially look just like the trailers except that they're designed to be lifted into place and hooked up to utilities on site, which saves uh, it does save some cost in that you don't have to re have those utilities. It is movable in that it's a module that can be uh, relocated if need be. But it's, it's really designed for uh, needs and locations where building the unit somewhere else is a lot more efficient. Uh, this is in a little remote mining uh, community in Papua New Guinea on a small island where everything that's built has to be shipped in along with the staff to do the building and so for them it's much more cost effective to have this unit built in a factory and delivered on site and set into place uh, to, op to operate rather than trying to build something um, in their location and should they ever need to relocate it or or scale up to a larger size. It's something that can be moved or sold. There's a shot of it on a truck leaving leaving Washington. The previous slide was a crane in Papua New Guinea unloading it. Uh, this is another uh, slaughter module that's in, in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii again is in the same situation where every piece of building material is imported from the mainland. And so it makes sense for them to integrate modules into their into their system. So I think I'll I'll leave it at there. We can certainly ask any answer any questions, but it's uh, it's a system that's worked out well for a variety of users throughout the world uh, that we've that we've worked with. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruce. And we're really sorry, everyone, about trying to get these slides correctly. We had to do PDFs today because. There were so many great photos, so we're trying to make sure that you can see them. Um, and so does anyone have any particular questions for Bruce about what you just saw and heard? I have a question. I have a question. Bruce, uh, it's Thomas uh, asking questions now. Uh, uh, how do you make the partition of the carcasses while they're still warm, or is it only half the carcass that you move into the cooling unit? Um, for for beef animals, they're brought in as sides, so half of beef. Uh, for the smaller animals, hogs and sheep and goats, they're they're brought in as whole carcasses. 
and there's a rail system set up so there's adequate space for them all to hang there and chill. Uh, the only issue we have with separation is with is with hogs that have to be separated from the other red meat. And we we try as much as possible to do hogs by themselves on separate days, but we can divide it with uh, sheets of plastic, a film to prevent cross contamination from one to the other. Uh, there was a question on cost. The, the cost today of one of these units. Fully, fully equipped with all of the installed equipment uh, as a trailer is about $210,000 US. There's a, a savings in a modular unit probably in the range of, range of thirty dollars to $50,000 depending on what pieces of equipment the customer doesn't require. The, the big one there is the electrical generator, which is an expensive piece of equipment to purchase and install. Great, Bruce. Thank you. There, um, I saw some other questions. Okay, uh, waste went on site at the farm. You know that. I know how you handle it where you are, Bruce. But I'm wondering how they're handling it in these other settings. Uh, that's that's handled very differently around the the country, um, depending on the local regulatory the agency that's involved. It's, it's not the USDA. It's it's a it's a local. Um, Department of Ecology or Health Department. On, on the site in Chile where they're operating every day, they are collecting all of the liquid, uh, water and blood and rinse water, and they're spreading it out on the farm fields as fertilizer. Um, they have sufficient pasture land to absorb that. The solid material, I believe at first they're rendering it, but they're looking at, at figuring out a way to compost it, uh, which is what we do here. Uh, but that's involving some work with the, uh, the health department where they can verify that uh, composting works as an acceptable way of returning the nutrients. In most cases, um, we don't really consider it, it waste. We consider it nutrients that really belong back in the soil. And so everybody's working on ways to do that. Most most states in the United States allow us to uh, do composting and then land apply it as a soil amendment. What about, um, do you have any of the offal being consumed? Are you able to capture any of that at such a small scale? Well, well some, so, uh, some, some of the viscera, viscera certainly, the, you know, heart um, and livers, uh, those, those are are packaged for food. The hides for beef cattle are sold. Um, we don't have the scale to justify cleaning stomachs for tripe or, or feet. And so those end up uh, as part of the compost operation. Great. And a couple yeah. other questions here about your capacity per hour in the trailer. And I'm wondering if that varies. Is this some of it is uh, your footprint and some of it is your team? I would guess. Right. The you know the two butchers that we have working can process approximately five or six sheep an hour between them. They can do about four pigs per hour, and it takes two people forty-five minutes to an hour to do a beef, depending on on the size size of it. And the cooler is sized to hold all of, you know, all of that amount of work. Um, okay, and how about one more question before we go to the next um, speaker? So this question about are the modular and other units privately owned or supported by grants or other resources? That's highly variable, isn't it? That's, that's all over the map. Um, we have individuals who have just ordered trailers and they're using them in their own business or companies. There have been uh, numerous instances where uh, the individual companies have been able to leverage some type of financial support from nonprofits or from uh, government grant programs that are trying to do economic development activities. 
Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, we, if folks have other questions for Bruce, you can post them in the chat box. Um, if Bruce is able to address some of them there, that's great, or we can try to get to them later. Um, I want to go ahead and move on to Thomas's presentation. Thomas Lick is a former officer in the Swedish Armed Forces. Okay, Thomas, you're, you're on now, and Bruce's mic is muted. And he's participated in uh, United Nations and NATO missions in Lebanon, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Iraq. So what is he doing here talking to you about mobile slaughter units? Well, he retired in 2014 after more than 28 years of service um, to become the head of the, and I'm going to butcher this name, Thomas, Halton Jeskinton slaughter unit. Thomas will tell us how you pronounce that in a minute. When we asked why, he said it was obvious. He said, I know a good logistical concept when I see one. The MSU itself was not why I changed careers. It was the combination of being a part of a unique concept and a really, really challenging task. And this company provides both. So as I said before, Thomas is the reason that we had this webinar today. And um, please go ahead and, and uh, take it away, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to mute my speakers because I have some problems with my headset. So if you, got, if you want to get in contact with me, uh, just write in the text box and I'll see that. Uh, first of all, thank you for letting me be a part of this webinar. I'm really happy to look forward to it. Uh, could you please move on to the slides, uh, or should I do that myself? There you go. First of all, um, I'm going to make a short presentation of the company, and it's pronounced Helsinge Stinta. Uh, it means, uh, the, the meaning of it is uh, girl from the province of Helsingland in the northern part of Sweden. So it's kind of a dialect. Uh, after this, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the logistic concept, and in the end, I'm going to talk about the mobile slaughter unit. So. The founder of Helsinki Stinta is actually on, on uh, the slide. Her name is Britt Marie Sticks, and she founded this company in 1999. Uh, and uh, she was actually tired of the bad quality of the meat in Sweden and wanted to do something about it. And today, uh, Helsinki Stinta is the market leader of premium meat in Sweden. And uh, this was the natural next step for us to do. Uh, in order to improve the meat quality even more. So next slide, please. Sorry. I'll, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the reason for me show, showing this uh, slide with me wearing Google Glass is actually to show the, the innovation of this company, the, the meat. They really want to be a part of innovation and to be uh, the leader of the market when it comes to development and new ways of seeing things. And uh, we're part of a research project at the Swedish uh, Agriculture University. Uh, actually, I had a meeting today about this, and uh, this is just one of, of four different areas that we're going to make a, a large research on for, on the next three years ahead. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll do it myself. Just a quick uh, uh, feedback. Is, do you hear what I'm saying? Okay, very good. I'm going to mute my speakers again. Uh, I'll move my slides myself. That's okay. Uh, this is actually the log logistic chain of, of the company Helsinki Stinton. And, uh, uh, as you can see, we removed uh, the animal transports to the slaughterhouse, uh, which you have on top of the slide. And our logistic chain consists of, of the farm itself, the mobile slaughter unit, a facility for tenderizing the meat, the butcher's uh, facility, and of course, a very good cooperation with the market. And this lacks uh, in almost every case otherwise in Sweden today, because for the farmer, the logistic chain stops at the stationary slaughterhouse. In our uh, system, 
they will have the context with, with the, the market itself. So we have a total concept for this. And you see the word eth ethical meat on the trader there, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. We, uh, we talk about ethical meat in our company, and we mean this by this, uh, these words. Eth ethical meat means to us good animal welfare. Sweden has one of the world's uh, strongest uh, regulations for handling uh, livestock, cattle, and, and animals. Uh, we want to have a minimized environmental impact. It's, it has to be safe and hygienic, and it has to be traceable and a high quality. Uh, the traceable part is really important to us because we got we are able to offer in, in, in a couple of weeks now uh, traceable meat from the farm to the uh, the consumer, the customer in the market. And we're doing this in cooperation with a company called Track Technology. And they bears the method patent for tracing meat in the whole logistic chain in Europe, in the United States, and in Russia, as it is at the moment. And they're backed up by a lot of different companies in Sweden. So this is something we're working on at the moment, and it's a really important ingredient in, in the concept that we have. This is the mobile slaughter unit uh, from Helsingas Tintan. You can see the 3D, small uh, 3D picture on the left top of the slide, and that shows only the, the slaughter unit itself. It's a truck and a trailer, and you have that on top of the slide as well. And the, the first truck consists of uh, office and lockers, uh, so that's a, a, an area for, for the personnel. I'm going to show you photos later on. Then you have the slaughter unit, and on the right side of the slide, you have the entrance into the stunning box. And then you have the bleeding part, uh, the de bleeding area. Uh, after that, you have the slaughter area where all the slaughter takes place. And then you have a cooling unit consisting of one truck and a trailer, and uh, it cons you can actually load 30 carcasses in the trailer and 10 in the truck. I also have in, in front of the truck an area to collect the hides in order to be able to transport them to, to a tannery maybe. Uh, you're going to see the, these photos later on, but that's basically the overview of it. And as Bruce said as well, we have machinery rooms in, in the front rows and in the front areas of the traders. And the whole unit itself is run by a generator of 85 kilowatts, so it's a really large uh, generator actually. Uh, and I, I have to talk meters now because uh, uh, the total area I need is about 27 times uh, 15 meters. Okay. This is actually the, the slaughter unit and uh, down below, I'm going to raise the slide. Uh, in the middle uh, of uh, the slide, you, you can see uh, one of our co-owners, uh, Mr. Olof Stenhammer, and also Britt Marie, the founder of the company on the right side, together with the, with the livestock, the animals. So this is just a, a few photos to show you how it looks like. This is actually animal welfare, and it's one of the things that's really important to us, and that's a good cooperation with the farmers. Uh, in order to get the best meat quality. So the work starts at the farm and then continues with the slaughter, of course. This is one of our, our partners. Uh, we were there uh, in the end of last year and slaughtered. And this is basically what we talk about. And th this is what's so special. I mean, to have the, the farmers uh, taking their animals to the stunning box themselves, into the gates, and, and as you can see, you can see it right through the stunning box. The animals can see right through it. That is important because they, they don't like to have uh, uh, bright areas. They don't like to have confined areas too much. Uh, you, of course, you need that in the stunning box, but up until then, it's, it's good if, you, if they have a calm uh, situation in order to get a good uh, meat quality. Another picture from the stunning box. Uh, this, 
this is how it looks like when the unit is deployed. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have a uh, uh, we don't have a, a awful container on this site. You can use the the, the, the the tractor as we do there there, but you can also have a container which I can show you later on. And that's one of the things we're going to develop later on because we're going to produce a, a a grinder, a big grinder with a tank for the offal that is supposed to be used for biogas production. Uh, just a quick uh, check, Catherine. Uh, you can still hear me, can you? J just right, right, yes, perfect. Just a few different photos from the different sites we've been to. This is uh, uh, the last one was from the middle parts of Sweden. This is from the southern parts of Sweden in December last year. And this is where the unit is deployed. And the next one shows uh, the unit deployed in the northern parts of Sweden. Uh, and uh, as you can see there, you have a container for offal. And you have a, a small pallet container for the heights. And also you can see that the, the, the whole roof of the, the slaughter trailer is uh, possible to raise up until about 6.5 meters in order to have the, the carcasses hanging on, on the higher rail. This is how the office and uh, locker room uh, is looking inside and uh, every slaughter, uh, every employee has their own locker with their private stuff and also one with their their gear that they're supposed to wear later on. You also have another space uh, uh, on the other side uh, where they have their slaughter equipment and you also have like a uh, station where you, you can clean yourself before you go into the, the unit. Uh, I have a question about the manning of, of the, the unit, and the basic manning is four slaughters, uh, one stunner, uh, one classifier, and two general uh, slaughter uh, personnel. Uh, and then I have a, a unit commander, and uh, then of course I have two drivers as well. So in total there's at the moment seven personnel manning the facility, and the capacity of the slaughter unit is uh, up to 30 heads a day. Uh, and I can store, as I told you earlier, in the cooling area, 40 uh, carcasses. And that's 80 halves, uh, uh, 80 sides carcasses. That's one of the reasons I asked Bruce about how, when you make a partition, because that, that's uh, one tricky thing from uh, a logistic point of view. Uh, one other thing uh, we often get questions about is uh, water and both the wastewater and the water. Uh, and uh, you can see in the trailer on the picture on the slide that I have tanks underneath. And I have about four cubic meters of, of fresh water with me and I have about the same amount of, of space for the wastewater afterwards. On the right side of the slide you can also see that I have a water purification system and a, a, a tank uh, where the, the, the water, uh, 300 liters of water stores before it goes into this, uh, the production. Uh, so that, that's basically the, the water issue. These are some photos from the inside and uh, this is not the easiest animal to, to slaughter. It's highland cattle. And that's, this was during the, the first week of slaughter, so that's why there's a lot of different uh, people looking at, at the animal. Uh, you can also see uh, the unit deployed in, in the site that we were in. There's, a, as you can see, a lot of different equipment, and uh, uh, good lighting is obviously really important, and also that it is easy to clean the unit. Uh, approximate radius of your service area for your MSU to the other ranches. Well, at the moment I only have one uh, cooling unit, so uh, I have to go, uh, for instance, next week I have a slaughter on Monday, then I go uh, to the next uh, farm to slaughter on Wednesday, and I'm going to slaughter on, on Thursday as well. So I have about 60, 70 uh, 
animals that I'm going to slaughter next week. And then I have the transportation back to my own tenderizing uh, warehouse uh, where the, the carcasses are hanging. And after that, they go into the, the butcher's, uh, the cutting facility for uh, wrapping and all that before it goes to the market. Good question, Robert. This is a, uh, an interior slide on the right side from uh, the cooling trailer. And as you can see, we, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, pelvic bone hanging in order to get the carcass uh, into actually uh, the cooling area. So we cannot use uh, uh, Achilles hanging in, in this place. And down below on the left side, you have uh, uh, the, the tenderizing facility, the warehouse we have in, in one of our, our cities, so to say. So we operate in the whole part of Sweden, actually. So it's uh, down south and up north, and uh, I mean Sweden is a long country, but so it takes a lot of time sometimes to to move the unit, but uh, it's there and we, we manage and it works. Uh, this is also an, a picture of of uh, the option I have now, and uh, I've used all my time now, but I'm going to just mention a few words before we go further with that. The offal is one of my largest costs and that's why I'm looking into making this uh, mobile grinder with the tank in order to, to produce biogas material. And I might even get paid to to, uh, to put that on deposit to the different uh, facilities for that. Uh, finally, good meat quality. Good animal welfare uh, is not always equal to, to good meat quality, but we believe that the, the mobile slaughter unit is one th way of, of doing that, and we strongly believe in this concept. And that's why we are on the market and one of the market leader, leaders in Sweden when it comes to this. Uh, I have a question about uh, problem in cold temperatures with the water storage tanks? No, we don't, because we have a, a, a le electrical heating in the water tanks, and that's one of the things that is really important when you operate in colder areas. That goes for the hoses as well. You, you need to have uh, heaters or heating devices in order to not to have it freezing for you. That was it. Uh, I'm going to unmute my speaker and... Uh, sorry, I'm going to unmute my speakers now, so I'm open to questions. Thanks, Thomas. There's a couple questions in the chat box. I just, let's address uh, Bob Gerlach's question and Judy Jones's question. Oh, I guess you just addressed Bob's. This question about, is your meat graded within the tenderizing facility? And then, um, I guess the other's not a question, it's a comment. Okay, I can... Uh... I can answer the, the, the grading, the classification of the meat takes place in the slaughter unit, and that's the European classification that, that is equal to the whole, the, the whole European Union. Uh, but then again, you have the marbling, and you cannot do the marbling uh, uh, checks in the slaughter unit because of the warm carcasses. You need to do that in the tenderizing facility. Okay? Great. Thank you so much, Thomas. I think uh, if other folks have questions, Thomas, if you could mute your microphone. Thank you. And then w if other folks have questions for Thomas, please put them in the chat box and he can answer there um, or uh, we'll see how much time we have. I want to move on to Mike, our final presentation. Mike Calicrate is a rancher from St. Francis, Kansas, who started his own meat company in the year 2000 and is now in the process of fine-tuning an on-farm slaughter facility. His food marketing company, Ranch Foods Direct, consists of a fabrication plant and retail store in Colorado Springs that's serving as the catalyst for rebuilding the local food system. Bruce and I actually had the pleasure of visiting Mike a few years ago and seeing how he was developing what he was doing and that was his first mobile slaughter unit operating out in Kansas. And I know just from photos that we've seen since then that it has really developed a lot since then. So we consider Mike uh, one of the great pioneers in this technology. So please, Mike, uh, tell us. Can you hear me, Lauren? 
this is Mike. If, if, or can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Well, thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. And Thomas, that was really interesting, uh, what you showed that you're doing there in Sweden. And Bruce, it's good to catch up with you as well on, on your progress around the world, it looks like. Uh, what I'd like to just do here today is catch people up. There was a previous webinar where we talked about our mobile slaughter unit and, and kind of take you from a little bit of review on, on that part and uh, from the last webinar in, into where we are today uh, the let's see if I can, yeah here we go so this is the this is the mobile slaughter unit that is really our second generation prototype uh, we, we did some things different on this mobile unit we decided to bring the animals into the front of the unit and then put the cooler in the back uh, where you would typically might think you'd be bringing animals in we, we are taking them out and we built an extension onto that unit where we've got a section where it's, we can quarter the animal outside of the cooler in that section between where the truck docks. So it's a sealed area, well lit and, and clean. Uh, and, and this picture you're looking at right now is really where the mobile unit was docked uh, with the cattle handling corral system knock box with, that's also a trailer on wheels. And, and the pad you see before you is, is where a building was going to be constructed where eventually we would like to see, wanted to see the mobile slaughter unit parked indoors inside because with our situation with Ranch Foods Direct, we need to, we need to use our mobile unit a lot and, and don't want to be uh, interrupted by, by bad weather or, or wind or dirt blowing and so forth. So we really wanted to get this unit inside and, and make a better working area for, for the people that are, that are working in it. Here is a, just a little bit of, of, of the other side of the unit. We, we've moved our cooler and, uh, unit on, and, and placed it on the side of the trailer so that it shoots directly in to where the carcasses are hanging. And, and then the two doors that you see just beyond the stairway are, are the doors where the hides would come out and, the, and also the, the slaughter waste, uh, the intestines and, and so forth. Uh, the, the trailer's got heat, it's got cooling. Uh, you can see the propane tank there. It's got a hot sea uh, water heating system uh, in it uh, for, for the hot water. This, get, this is just a little better view of the, of the actual kill box uh, that goes with the portable use of the unit. This kill box has a scale on it for the live animal weight, and then it's also you can hook on and, and uh, to a like a ton pickup. It's heavy, and just load up all of your panels and and go anywhere you need to go. Uh, but as I said, uh, with Ranch Foods Direct, we need to we need to have constant use of the facility or of the unit at Calgary Cattle Company in St. Francis. So we've really gone more beyond the docking station to more of a, of a permanent type of a, of a location. Inside the unit, uh, to catch people up on, on the transition from the prototype number one to prototype number two, is we built in a hide puller. So when this animal's on the cradle and you're skinning it down, you're able to hook onto the hide uh, on the rear legs of the animal and, and pull it off uh, all the time working that hide and cutting to make sure you get a good dress on the carcass and, and lift that animal, raise it up to the rail at the same time as you're pulling the hide in the opposite direction. And then it's set up to uh, you split the carcass uh, and prior gut it and split it prior to going into the, into the cooler section. And prior to going into the cooler area, we, we put an antimicrobial spray on, on that carcass. Now, now into the new, the new thing as we've sort of transitioned into a more full-time slaughter operation. You can see in, the, in this photograph uh, at the old cattle working area that, that's been there for 25 years on the right. And then there's that new area that's not painted yet. It's the, it's the newly built steel corral system 
with 10 by 10 compartments. This limits the movement of the animals. So they can't run and, and, and they're not going to want to jump and it just, just keeps them more confined and much calmer. The other thing that in this, in this photograph, if you look at, at the top of the photograph, you see a couple of piles directly above the, the peak in the building and, and that's our compost area where we compost manure with slaughter waste. And between the building and those piles is a water catchment pond that qualifies for our water disposal uh, with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. So we have no water treatment costs on the disposal of, of washed down water. We catch our blood, that goes into the compost pile as well as the, as the slaughter waste that, that, we, that, we, uh, that we end up turning back into fertilizer uh, to go back on cropland and is used by farmers in the area. Here's a kind of a close up area of, of some hogs that are that are going to be that are being processed, and there's a four foot door in the building on your on your left that opens, and then there's a, a couple of swing gates that that connect to the kill box uh, inside of that door. And so as these animals are are being brought into the building and knocked and hung and and make their way through the process, we're able to close the door to keep it clean inside and, and then when other animals are needed we'll typically kill a couple at a time uh, before and then we close the door so we can so we can keep the area sanitary and clean. This is the inside of the of our new facility. Uh, the trailer as you can see the mobile slaughter unit is now inside. It backs up through that big overhead door in the center of the picture. Just to the left of the overhead door is a is a new kill box uh, that was designed by my son Tegan, and it's it's pretty unique. It, it catches uh, their neck. It's got a, a head catch, and and the whole side of that lifts up, so there's nothing blocking the exit of that animal to be able to roll out. Uh, whereby then the, the hoist lifts it, uh, we bleed it, catch the blood, and then and put it on the cradle, where it's then brought over to uh, a hide puller that uh, is in the center right of your picture. You can see the steps and the, and the rollers and that chain and hook hanging down is, is what we pull the hide with. So we've kind of got a combination of, of, of mobile slaughter unit, but we've moved some of the, some of the work uh, out of the mobile slaughter unit to where now inside all we're doing is gutting the animal, splitting it, and cooling it. A little bit more detail, uh, this is the kill box. As you can see, the side of that kill box opens up entirely. There, there's nothing there, so the, even the, the part where the head catch uh, is goes up with that gate after the animal was knocked. And you can see the, the, the hoist there uh, that, that we bleed, lift the animal with, and that's got, a, that's got about a 20-foot uh, height, so you can do any size animal in this. And then on the right is, is just a little more, a better, better picture of the, of the hide puller. Uh, and and the, way that, the way that we're uh, doing the, the, the hide puller is we're lifting that animal with a spreader bar off of the cradle. So it's a combination, sort of a combination cradle rail system here. And uh, if I can get this to move up a bit. You can see that that spreader bar actually connects to the trolleys, which then is lifted by the hoist and placed on the rail. It, it's really slick, uh, so there's no danger. It's it's very simple. There's no there's no risk to the to the operator below, and it just simply lines up with that back plate and and, and lands that animal on the rail, and from there it goes inside the mobile unit. Where it is, where evisceration takes place. This animal that you're seeing right now, that that the the butcher is is uh, getting ready to eviscerate, is an 1,800 pound Angus Wagyu animal, uh, the, and it's it's about three inches off of the floor. So this is really our limitation is in size. This is a, a huge animal, a 1,250 pound animal, which is very which is very typical. Uh, would would easily clear the floor. And one of the things that, that I 
that we did just in the last few weeks is we we actually when this unit was first built we had a piece of the rail that, that rotated around to where you could turn the carcass 90 degrees and 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 saw and use your and have more room to saw and split the carcass well that was such a troublesome problem especially with a big animal uh, to rotate that around so that basically what we did as you can see in the in the picture on the right is we we simply uh, moved the rail over about eight inches so it jogs over eight inches to where there's a very comfortable space to to be able to split that carcass and and then move it on into the cooler it's and then the carcass is weighed just prior to going into the into the cooler so we've already got our data on on what the yield was on the animal uh, just that just that quick uh, and we can do everything in this trailer I mean we can do uh, beef bison uh, we can do goats uh, you know hogs lambs and, and we have not ever processed a bison in this facility but as you can see from those outside pins they're built for that purpose and in one of the designs uh, of those pens with the 10 by 10 sections is, is specifically for bison because they can they can if you give bison any room at all to, to run they can jump nearly they can either jump or climb just about any fence that, that you can build and 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 of course this is a this is a fully inspected USDA slaughter facility so uh, we are we in fact in the new building we have a uh, Probably the nicest USDA office in the region uh, for for our for our inspectors to 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 do their job. So as it leaves that part of the floor where we've eviscerated and, and split the carcass, uh, the picture on the left is the carcass cooler. It will hold 20 animals. We're we're processing in beef about one animal every 20 minutes. So you know our, we expect to do around 20 animals per day, and with the cooling. A capacity that we have in this cooler we are able to cool these animals uh, down to the 38 to 40 degrees uh, easily by the next morning and one of the one of the really nice nice additions as you can see in the right side of the picture uh, is is this docking station uh, for or actually an unloading sort of a docking station for your carcass delivery truck and, and our philosophy is I don't want to use my slaughter unit to haul animals I, I want to keep it busy processing and I want to haul animals with with a carcass transport truck or trailer uh, and 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 uh, you'll see that in just a minute one of the new things that we that we were only two weeks into this project the bones uh, we we the bones from the slaughter so you got your heads your feet uh, and we bring back our bones from ranch foods direct where we do our processing so we've got a lot of bones that we're now turning into bone char and this is the Exeter retort uh, manufactured in Ohio but actually the company that invented this machine is out of England Exeter Exeter England and uh, we've we were excited about the possibility of putting this carbon uh, back in the soil the, the charcoal and, and of course it's got with with it's made out of bones it's got a 36 percent phosphorus and a 33 percent calcium uh, uh, ratio so it, we think this is pretty exciting and and can be some value added to the process. So this is this is one of the trailers that we've got available. That's a, that's a rail trailer uh, that that can haul 60 carcasses, uh, and then we've got another uh, smaller truck that can haul 16. And when I say carcasses, I'm talking beef carcasses, so it can haul a lot more hogs and smaller species. So basically, the benefits we talk about when we slaughter animals where they are. It is the humane benefit less stress means better quality meat 37 percent less weight transported to the market that is really really significant in, in in savings slaughter waste becomes valuable soil nutrients and of course places like st. Francis Kansas really really need the jobs uh, we, we've got we've got a lot of people that that need opportunity and, and they need to be living wage good income generating jobs this is the plant in Colorado Springs this plant, this car, this cooler holds about a hundred animals, and and we have a full cutting facility uh, that goes with this uh, that you'll see in this next picture. Uh, 
So you've got the, the truck dock, you've got uh, the cutting room on your lower left, and then we've got a full retail store. So we've got a direct connection to the, to the eater, to the consumer. We sell to about 120 restaurants, and about 40% of our total sales, though, come out of this little 800-square-foot retail store. And just getting into some of the numbers, uh, these are very similar to the numbers I presented at the last webinar. Uh, but, you know, assuming the 20 working days, you know, we're, we're looking at about, I mean, this is very conservative at 10 head per day, but around $650 of income, high credits, that's going to be a little higher. I didn't make an adjustment, but I'm putting that in at 400 a day, so your total income is about 1,000. Could easily become 2,000. And then utilities, uh, labor. This cost of ownership is a, is a, is a really, uh, uh, that's a guess. We've got $360,000 invested in this new trailer, and that includes the kill box and, and, the, and the cattle corral system. Uh, and, and so I'm saying if you borrow 100% of the money, you don't put any down, and, and you're paying 6% interest at 10, for 10 years, that's, a, that's $200 a day. That, that's, a, that's a big number that can be reduced quite a bit if, if we've got some equity in it. Uh, we've, we've even got some USDA grant money available that, that could pay for a big piece of this, uh, perhaps. And, and so anyway, the, the point is it makes sense. Uh, but it's very critical, it's very, very important that you have that cut facility uh, available uh, to be able to market this product. Uh, we want to go to retail with as much as possible and do as little business uh, with with wholesale as as we can. And when I when I say wholesale, I'm talking about selling into the existing system of, of big retail. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. That was great. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, how many head are you doing per year? We are. We are doing, yeah, we're doing about. Uh, 2000 a year uh, for our own business. Uh, and then Ranch Foods does about that many more, uh, a few more than that actually, about 2500 a year for other people that are getting their animals slaughtered other places and bringing those to us uh, for, for further value added processing. So, and then in addition to that, we, we're, we're doing hogs and that's scaling up fairly quickly. And it, so that would be in addition to those beef numbers that we, that we talked about. Can you tell us um, about the cost of the steel cell building, the site prep and the concrete? Yeah, and, and one, of the, one of the ideas behind that building uh, is, is that it's a multi-purpose farm building. So if, I, if we ever decide we don't want to do this anymore, that, that, that makes a great farm building. So it's multi-purpose, it, and, and that was important. Uh, rather than a brick and mortar, you know, slaughter only plant, which is, you know, I can tell you from the ones that have been built here recently, that's $300 a square foot. But when you, when you can put up a steel building like what we did, it's, it, you know, it's, it's less than half. It's less than half that much. Plus, you know, you can, you can do a lot of other things with the building. So, uh, you know, I, you know I, we put a little bit extra into the building uh, because we had some other needs. So half of the building is slaughter. And half of the building is shop, and the shop includes sleeping rooms for guests. Or if our if our truck driver from Colorado Springs comes down, he's part of the slaughter crew. He's got a place to sleep that night, right on site. So with a full kitchen and, and all of that over there. So, uh, but this whatever a farm building would cost to put up is essentially uh, what what this building cost. And then of course you've got the steel structures to put inside and. You know, you've got a floor drain, you've got some additional expense, but not, not a tremendous amount. And, and the question, I see also, I, I also see a question here uh, about uh, what constitutes a docking facility. And, and really, that, that's pretty open. I mean, uh, in, in Bruce's slides where he showed the concrete corral system with the kill box and, and the concrete pad, to me, that, that's a docking station. And that's opposed to, as opposed to one of Bruce's earlier slides that showed a, 
a, a totally mobile unit that, that goes out every day to a different location, hauls the carcasses to the cut plant. So when you do a docking station, it's something that you're going to move to and stay with for a period of time, whether it's days, weeks, or, or until you want to move. One of the things that we're seeing in Colorado, we, we, we lost GNC Packing Company in Colorado Springs, so we lost a, in a really important slaughter operation. We're looking at the possibility of bringing that same mobile unit that's at St. Francis to Colorado Springs and setting up something similar to what we have in St. Francis. And then all I have to do in St. Francis is put up my cooler panels inside the building so I've got my cooler for my drip, drip car, for my drip uh, cooler for my carcasses and then, and then just load out of there right onto trucks. Which, which then it becomes Let's take a couple more questions. Mike, why don't you check the chat box and when I'm on and you're on, we both seem to echo. <laughs> Well, let me, yeah, the question is, uh, how do you handle wastewater from the unit? That wastewater goes into that collection, that collection pond. Uh, in fact, I can go back, I think, and, and show you uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, let me just get there. So, so this is the slide that we talked about where if you look at the peak of the building in, on the left, you've got two compost piles there on the, on the, on the hill uh, east of that building. Well, between that building and those compost piles is a collection pond. You really can't see it in this picture, but it's, it's a fairly good size waste containment facility for water. And so it catches the water out of those pens on, on the upper right and, and catches all of the water from the slaughter area. And, and any runoff from washdown, et cetera, goes into that pond. But it goes through a terrace system where it's filtered out, and when when things are growing, it's a bi it's really a bile filter of plant materials, and it's it's it just cleans up the water very very nicely. And so we don't have a water treatment system in this in this facility, and, and there isn't one required by the state. I think um, we're coming close to the end. What I'd like to do is have all three of our speakers address this question. This is a great question that Robert Gibson asked which is, you know, we've seen here on this webinar everything from a, a small-scale unit that's highly mobile to a more complicated unit that's being moved around Sweden to, a, you know, a unit that's essentially modular. You can move it, but you choose to keep it where it is. Um, so what are the trade-offs in terms of a very mobile unit and a modular unit related to your logistics for cut and wrap or other things? So. That could be sort of our, our wrapping up question that, that all three of you could address. Mike, why don't you start us? And the whole thing with our slaughter unit and process is, is it's tied to Ranch Foods Direct, which is the meat company I started in 2000, you know, 15 years ago. And really, it was all about getting myself connected to a market outside of the big meat packers. And, and so for a long time, we used GNC Packing Company in Colorado Springs, so we were hauling live animals. And then you, got, you just start evolving and thinking about, well, what could, how can we make this better? Well, what if we could kill the animal where they're at? Uh, you know, what if we're going to use it every day? And, and, and so this is where we've just come to. But it's taken us about three and a half years to get to this point, because we were very happy using the totally mobile unit outside killing eight to ten head a day. Uh, but the, but the, the employees were, you know, there were days when the snow was blowing that you didn't get that done. And you didn't do anything. And now really we're able to run every single day. So I think it's, it's a lot dependent upon what is your market for your product. Uh, and, and I always suggest that wherever you, you locate your further value added cut location where people are, you need those eaters. And so Colorado Springs makes sense. We've got 650,000 people here. And this is the place I want to locate my further value-added cut facility. And, and then I minimize that freight of, on live animals. And, I, and when I cut it up, I'm right there where the eaters are. And, and so to me, that, that works the best for me in, in my situation. Thanks. OK, so how about, Mike, if you would mute your microphone, and then maybe Thomas, you want to unmute and tell us your thought? Yeah, Mike, uh, that, that was actually 
a very good uh, conclusion you, you mentioned about uh, how you started and all that because it's actually similar to us because we wanted to be uh, in the driving seat uh, for our company when it comes to uh, getting all the 6,000 carcasses we need every year because that's what we aim for and that, that's what we sell in Sweden. Uh, to be in charge of the whole process is really important to us, the whole logistic chain. That's why we also started working with the traceability uh, together with track technology. And that is important to us because we want to be the best uh, premium meat company in Sweden, uh, market leading of course, and also add a value when it comes to, to uh, good meat quality. And this is one way of doing it. Uh, basically, that's how it is. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I mean, it's really clear that the success of all of these units is really about the throughput, about, I mean, all three of these folks have really developed their markets, which generates the pull through so that it's really, um, it's really moving. So Bruce, you want to give us the last word as the most mobile unit in the group? Maybe Bruce is having a technical difficulty. Okay, oh, okay. There he is. Now, I have to turn it off and turn it back on. The mute function doesn't work for some reason. Um, I think it, whether you're going with a modular or a truly mobile, really it kind of depends on your situation, your scale, who you're serving, and, and what their needs are. In our case here with IGFC, we go to each farm uh, in large part so those animals don't have to be transported. They're actually slaughtered on the farm that they were born on. Um, and, the, and a mobile unit, uh, as, as ours, is much less expensive than building a fixed, fixed facility. So it's a great way to get into, the, get into the business. I think Mike demonstrated that. They used a, a mobile facility he set up in Kansas. Uh, he, he got it operating. He started selling the meat, demonstrated that he had a, a, a viable business to run, and then it made sense for him to, to move that unit and, and off someplace else so somebody else can use it, and then he rebuilt something that's, that's more stationary uh, that better meets his needs that he essentially grew into. He didn't start there. He started smaller, proved his concept, proved his market, uh, saw the need for more capacity and, and was then able to justify the, the cost of developing that. And in his case, his animals don't go very far because they're already there on his ranch in Kansas. So he, in a way, he has the best of both worlds. To start with a fixed, a really fixed facility is, is quite a large upfront expense. And until you demonstrate a market need for it, um, it's, it's hard to justify. So. Uh, there's a there's a combination here. The modular units we've shipped to remote places certainly makes sense for them rather than building a fixed facility, even though they're never going to move, uh, just because of the very high cost of building in places like the the smaller islands in Hawaii and and remote islands like the one in Papua New Guinea. Um, well, thank Julie, you, thank Julie. you, Bruce, for that. I'm glad that I gave you the last word because um, you've seen this through uh, lots of different places. So we, I always hate to cut these off, but um, we are we need to wrap up. It's ten past the hour, and this has been an, an excellent webinar. Thank you so much to our speakers and to our audience for the great questions. And I uh, just wanted to remind you that the webinar has been recorded and it will be posted to the MPAN website and we will send information about that out to our MPAN listserv. So if you aren't on our listserv, you can go to our homepage and sign up or you can email us. Um, Catherine and I will one last time write our, yep, Catherine's posted the, the uh, homepage there. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And again, many thanks to our great speakers today. Goodbye.